Good afternoon. I'm your last presentation today, and I would like to speak to you about some of the work we've done under the IMPACT project, looking at sensory quality mapping and branding, and how we can use sensory maps towards building technology toolkits to support niche marketing of COCO. I'll begin my presentation by speaking a little bit about market segmentation that exists in the cocoa and chocolate sector, and then how this is linked to quality. Then we will talk a little bit about the quality challenge with regards to the expectations from chocolate makers, the harsh reality that exists on the ground with producers and having cocoa quality defined. We will then get, get into some of the work done under the impact project where we investigated geographical variation in flavor with some snapshots of the results to highlight branding opportunities. Then we will speak briefly about our work in building branding toolkits that serve to build trust in the possible brands. And finally, how these can be leveraged in business to business interactions for marketing. Let's look at how the cocoa and chocolate market is segmented. The cocoa that is traded internationally is classified as either bulk or ordinary cocoa or fine or flavor cocoa. Bulk cocoa accounts for 95% of the cocoa that is traded and is mainly used in the production of high volume chocolate lines with lower cocoa solids and comes primarily from West Africa. And this quality is mainly linked to physical attributes with some limits of physical and flavor defects allowed. Fine or flavor cocoa, on the other hand, accounts for the remaining 5% and is traditionally important in blends with high cocoa solids content chocolates. And it's classified mainly based on the complexity of flavor and the presence of unique aromatic attributes that are expressed by the expertise of the producer in post-harvest processing. These cocos also reflects the terroir or sense of place of the environment and where it is fermented and dried as well as grown and may offer important genetic diversity as well as historical and cultural heritage. There's also a price premium associated with final flavor cocoa that's linked to its market appreciation and value and valuation of a particular origin. With this current marketing classification used, we can see that there are subdivisions in this slide within the two types based on quality, flavor and certifications, each with its own specific price band and volumes available. Bulk cocoa occupies the lowest tier with the lowest price but has the highest volumes available. The current price point for Trinidad and Tobago cocoa puts it in the high end final flavor section, but we occupy close to the lowest level within this tier, or just above the lowest level. So we therefore need to look at opportunities to maximize our revenue potential from the very small volumes of cocoa that we produce, which is about just under 400 metric tons. So there's a need for us to find other ways to improve our quality and niche market within this already small, premium, high-end segment of the cocoa market. Looking now at global chocolate market trends, we can see that the Swiss really love their chocolate. 19.8 pounds of chocolate per year per person. We see that the growth forecasted in this sector is about 7% annually, with the dark chocolate segment occupying about 31% of this market share. And although milk chocolate still rules, dark chocolate consumption is growing. And this growth in consumption is linked to the health benefits associated with consuming dark chocolates. And also segmentation within this, within this market segment where customers are becoming more sophisticated and demanding experiences or experience-based chocolates that are linked to traceability, unique flavors and recipes, as well as social and environmental 
um, responsibilities, all linked to origin. So we now have niche and ultra niche boutique marketing of chocolates in premium and super premium selections based on small micro, micro lot volumes of cocoa. This super premium boutique chocolate segment creates unique customer experiences through having traceable and well-defined cocoa origins and well-defined flavor diversity or well-documented flavor diversity. And this market tells a story through chocolate with responsible sourcing, high quality, stringent quality controls, and essentially raises the bar on the expectations for a bean to bar chocolate, where customers are willing to pay high prices. A recent survey on the impact and recovery analysis of the chocolate market for 2020 to 2024 suggests a trend towards increasing premiumization of chocolates to boost growth in this super premium segment. Arising from the consumer and chocolate maker expectation of high quality ingredients in this super premium boutique chocolate segment comes the quality challenge, where there's very often a disconnection between the expectation of cocoa quality from the producer and the reality that exists in the cocoa supply value chains at many origins. The expectation is often that we have relatively good yields, good organization of the production and processing systems with high consistent bean quality. Sadly, there are only really a very, very few models like this that exist at origin. The harsh reality experienced by many cocoa farmers at origin are really poor production systems, poor yields, value chains that are convoluted and disjointed with a really unclear understanding about what cocoa quality is. And I've seen this in my 25 years working in cocoa, traveling to many countries at origin where quality is sometimes very nebulous. It's not clearly understood by people who buy cocoa, by people who sell cocoa, and it's not clearly communicated. And sometimes farmers simply just don't have the resources or power to make significant changes to their systems to do better. So this is a real dilemma. And one key step towards breaking this seemingly vicious cycle is firstly having a clear definition of what cocoa quality is that can be understood and clearly communicated to stakeholders in the cocoa value chain. In 2015, the European Cocoa Association and many other industry partners demystified cocoa quality by giving a definition that is very holistic. And it included the all important aspects of flavor and purity, as well as physical characteristics that have a direct bearing on manufacturing performance, giving credence to aspects such as traceability, geographical indications and certification to indicate the sustainability of production models. Notice that flavor comes first in this definition as expressed by optimized post-harvest processing and monitored and maintained by attention to food safety, both in terms of physical, chemical, and microbial considerations and physical bean attributes linked to manufacturing. So the, the holistic part of this definition comes from the consideration of traceability, geographical indications, and certification. With this understanding of quality and the market segmentation that we realize that has occurred, there's an opportunity for high quality cocoa that is linked to flavor and origin. And we decided under the impact project to investigate the geographical variation in flavor linked to diversity, quality, and potential marketing opportunities in this premium boutique chocolate segment. So I'll go into some details of this experiment now. So the first thing we needed to understand, and this was our research question, was is there a geographical variation in flavor 
across Trinidad. Next, we needed to really understand what is the typical flavor profile for Trinidad cocoa and how does this vary across the national cocoa production system? How does it vary regionally? And how does it vary across the cocoa farms at the cocoa farm level? All the while thinking about how can we explore and exploit opportunities for niche branding. So basically, we focused on farms that were nested in cocoa growing communities located in the six different agroecological zones we have identified in Trinidad. And we set about trying to provide a scientific basis or scientific based evidence for the ultra niche marketing of cocoa. To achieve this, we embarked on a two-year study to characterize flavor potentials from cocoa market lots using optimized styrofoam cooler fermentations that Nyla would have spoken about earlier. We employed a stratified bean sampling plan where between 20 to 30 kilograms of good quality wet cocoa beans were received from 36 farms across the 22 growing um, communities with at least one sample from each agroecological zone. It was very important in this experiment to have the beans inoculated on farm by having them exposed for three to four hours in the shade before coming to the Coke Research Center for fermentation. And this inoculation occurred by having the fruit flies um, come onto the beans, bringing their natural inoculation from the environment, also the workers' hands from extracting the beans, etc. And this unique varietal mix and initial microbial inoculation started off the fermentation. And we just monitored the fermentation at the Cook Research Center and make sure that the natural microbial succession was optimized towards an optimal endpoint with then drying at our facility. These two maps show the various farms in the cocoa communities across the agroecological zones that were sampled in this two year study. And you would see based on the bean availability and transportation, logistics, etc., we try to sample at least one farm from each of the agroecological zones. And this was much more challenging than you think it would be. Eh? This is how we carried out and monitored the fermentations in, the, in these estate inoculated beans. We measured fermentation temperature and pH with cut tests of the beans during fermentation. And most importantly, we took bean samples from the fermentation mass from fermentation days four, five, and six, and in one instance, um, from day seven. And these were sun dried uh, gradually in a, in a covered tunnel dryer. And then we, we did our physical assessment and made liquors for sensory evaluation. The protocols used for making liquors were all standardized and published, and the sensory evaluation was carried out by a trained panel of tasters in a completely randomized block design across 38 flavor attributes. And these are the same attributes that are used in the Cocoa of Excellence program and the Heirloom Cocoa Preservation Initiative program. So there is great industry support and adoption for the, the um, protocols that we have used. So now on to the exciting part. How did these results look like and what are the opportunities we discovered to exploit branding of flavor niches at the national level, regional level and estate level? And of course, you'd have heard about the varietal branding opportunities from Nyla. In looking at the country level flavor diversity towards our national branding potential, we basically uh, took the average of each flavor attribute from the most optimal day of fermentation across the 36 farms that we sampled from in the 22 growing communities sampled. We looked at the maximum, minimum, and average uh, attribute intensity, and we looked at as well at the dominant 
flavor attributes, complementary attributes, and, and the core attributes, and we found the results to be very interesting. The dominant attributes observed across all samples were fresh fruit and brown fruit, and we saw some distinctions made within, within each of these categories in terms of uh, the fresh fruit. We had tropical fruits that were um, reminiscent of berries or citrus. Within the brown fruit, we had uh, notes that were distinctly reason, reason type notes, or linked to um, cooked reasons. And other complementary notes that we found were also linked to floral notes that were either fresh flowers, some of them were um, like orange blossom in nature, or herbal notes, um, woody notes, and sometimes mild spice, nutty and sweet notes. The core attributes were moderate, fruit acidity, and balanced bitterness and astringency that was all tied together with a robust chocolate flavor base. And this gives a, a, a sort of idea, this sort of representation gives a, a good idea of the main attributes that we can say exist in well-prepared Trinidad cocoa as part of a national flavor brand. And we can see um, from the middle table here what the desired range would be on a 0 to 10 point scale. And if we look at the average values from what we found across the 36 farms, um, they were all within the desired range on the 10 point scale. Next, we decided to take the same data and plot it as a bar graph where we're able to look at uh, visually the maximum, minimum, and average intensities. And we can see more clearly that brown fruit and fresh fruit flavors were always present, but there was some interesting polarization in the presence and absence sometimes of floral flavors, spice flavors, nutty notes, and sweet flavor notes. Acidity was also interested in that we saw that it varied widely. Um, there was a, a two point difference uh, in the maximum and minimum scores. So this indicates that there, there could be a potential for regional branding according to cocoa communities. So let us explore this level now. What I decided to do was to focus on the average flavor profiles from five cocoa communities to see what sort of regional flavor diversity we can, we can see and what are the opportunities that could exist for branding cocoa communities. So I decided to look at uh, Cedrus, Maruga, in southwest and south Trinidad, um, Rio Claro, Ecclesville in south central Trinidad, and then two communities in Tamana. We have the um, Four Roads Tamana, which is uh, on hilly terrain, and then we have Guayco Tamana, which is on flatter land. So let's let's look at this in some more detail now. So the next few slides will present a bit of the history of each of these communities along with the average flavor profile from the farm sampled and a description of the main flavor profile trends. You would notice that the average flavor profile is presented in these cool looking circular polar plots with a different color for each attribute and the height of each slice indicates the intensity of the flavor with the standard error of the panel at the top, at, uh, at the top of each slice as the small bar. And you will notice that we have very low standard error values. Uh, uh, so these bars are very, very small or short. And this indicates that we had good panelist consistency and alignment. So looking firstly at Cedrus, Cedrus historically is a fishing village with many um, coconut groves at some um, cocoa estates in between. It's, it's a peninsula. And overall, there was a, a a mild to delicate flavor profile with mixed floral notes, fresh brown, fresh and brown fruit notes respectively, light woody and nutty notes, and a mild sweet and spice note towards the end with a mild cocoa flavor finish. So overall, this was a very mild sample. Next, 
We're looking at Maruga. This is another fishing village, but also noted for cocoa and oil extraction, but, and also the home of the Maruga rain-fed hill rice and the hottest pepper in the world, the Maruga scorpion pepper. The flavor profile here, it was not hot like pepper, but it was balanced between fresh and brown fruit notes with some fresh berry notes and a bright floral flower note. Uh, balanced fruit acidity, bitterness and astringency, and a good base of flavor. So notice the difference in words that I'm using here to describe uh, Moroga compared to Cedrus. Moving up to Rio Claro, Ecclesville. This is mainly a cocoa growing area and an economic hub for that region of Trinidad. The average flavor profile from the farms in this area had a clear and distinct brown and yellow raisin type character. Again, a different word I'm using to describe the dominant flavor attribute here. Slight acidic aroma, mild sweet note with the raisin character, a mild astringency bitterness and a moderate basal cocoa flavor and a clean finish. So this was very different to Moruga, which was also different to Cedrus. Four Roads Tamana. As I said, this is hilly and it's located at the foot of Mount Tamana. It's a real cocoa hub in this area. This had a very complex flavor profile with lots of attributes, but all in good balance. It started off with mild floral notes, which is cooked raisin type notes and fresh fruit notes, bright acidity again, moderate bitterness and astringency, and a mild, nutty, sweet and spice notes towards the finish. So very complex here. Looking now at Guayco Tamana, where this area is located uh, close to a tributary of the Urupuch River, it's more low-lying. The flavor notes were less complex, with moderate fresh and brown fruit notes, with moderate acidity, uh, herbal, floral, and tobacco spice notes, mild nutty notes that had some astringency linked to it, so we notice there's a bit higher astringency in this sample, and moderate basal cocoa flavor. Now I should mention there are two kinds of characteristics to the astringency attribute. One that is very aggressive where the astringency pulls on your palate and there's a, the, the desire and urge to salivate. And the other where the astringency gives a, a sort of mouth, a velvet like mouth feel to the sample. Much like um, taking a red wine where you have a, a velvet like consistency on your palate. Now, you may think that I'm saying almost the same thing for each region, but what we're really seeing here is the nuanced nature of the flavor profiles in each of the cocoa growing communities, making a case for regional level branding, either via collective marks or geographical indications. Once we can, we can establish um, firm differences in terms of other aspects of the origins. So have a look at this um, little sample animation that I have here that gives a sort of dynamic to the changes that we saw in the notes that I mentioned in terms of acidity, cocoa flavor, etc., uh, bitterness and astringency, and the fresh fruit notes. So let's take a deep dive now into the estate level. So I'm talking to you like it's an onion that we're peeling off layers. So I started at the national level, then I did um, the regional level, now I'm looking at the estate level. So I'm going to take a deep dive into Tamana, where we have Four Roads Tamana and Guayco Tamana. The profiles may look similar at first glance, but we also see evidence of the sort of nuanced presentation of the intensity of the flavor attributes, as well as balance between these attributes and acidity, the presence of fresh and brown fruit notes, some floral notes, spice notes, nutty notes that were present in different farms in the area. And there's a commonality between the astringency and bitterness and cocoa flavor that ties everything together. And this is really something that makes Trinidad special, where we have a very balanced profile. It's not polarized any one way. We give a lot of diversity and complexity, but very balanced as well. Think of an orchestra uh, playing a piece of complex music that is very, very well um, written 
and coordinated in the delivery. And this is what Trinidad is, is really um, noted for. So again, if we look at the graphs of the different farms, if you pay attention to the, the, the brown slices, the light and dark green slices, the sort of orange slices, um, the, the pale cream and light brown, we can see how the heights of these slices change according to the farm. So this highlights the nuanced intensity of these attributes. And the animation again highlights it a bit better. So what does this all mean? How can we, how can we make this work for us? We can pull this together along with the other activities that we engage in in the impact project to build trust, to facilitate estate and community level branding for the boutique market. Let's see how under the impact project, we have been able to monitor and optimize fermentation in light of the mixture of varieties across the farms and pulp quality to best express the flavor potential of the mixture of varieties that exist. And we also realized that trust is an important consideration and a, an, an important component of brands and is bolstered by a good story, certification of the farm, the facilities and process, traceability, and the actual product. In this regard, we have worked on producing estate stories for a cross-section of our farms in the project. We've carried out assessment of key performance indicators of the systems for post-harvest processing on the farms. And we have done product assessment to establish elements of a dossier for each farm in each community in each of the agroecological zones that can be displayed as either GIS maps or on a performance dashboard that identifies areas that need improvement. Other certification is also important in terms of organic, social and environmental sustainability. Having the potential for brands established and the toolkits for building confidence in these brands supported by independent certifications, we should now look at how these brands can be leveraged in business-to-business -business interactions. And business-to-business -business interactions are supported by the scientific evidence that we have been able to provide so that these cocoa microlots can be marketed as firstly, a Trinidad and Tobago national cocoa brand, and we have one such brand, a true Trinidad and Tobago um, Trinitario brand. We have regional brands from cocoa communities. We have the Montserrat Cocoa Farmers Cooperative in Grand Coover, and they have successfully registered a geographical indication locally. They're seeking to have this registered uh, internationally with the EU. We have estate level branding. So, for example, we have San Juan Estate, and a few other estates, and we also have varietal branding. So it's truly an exciting time when we can provide a dossier of robust technical information to support national, regional, and estate brands with documented histories and profiles. It's like dating with your CV, trying to find the best match to capitalize on your best attributes. And this is exactly the, the direction that we need to head towards as we seek to maximize revenue potential for our cocoa micro lots in the high stakes boutique cocoa and chocolate markets. And this is an example of what such a dossier can look like. This is one that, that uh, exists for La Colotte Estate in Tamana. We've added the flavor profile information to the existing as documented estate history. And just to end now, after all is said and done, we must remember that well-prepared Trinidad and Tobago origin cocoa represents a very well-balanced and versatile flavor profile that can either stand alone or be used in blends. It represents a final flavor potential and not a birthright. We have to put in the work in each and every fermentation batch of cocoa to maximize the expression of this flavor potential that we are very proud to claim as our own and seek accolades from, and to secure premium marketing opportunities with. 
I want to thank the hard-working farmers locally and globally on whose backs rest the tides of our global cocoa and chocolate industry. I would also want to thank the IDB lab for their support of the impact project and all the farmers who participated and contributed of their time and resources towards the study. Thank you very much. And at Cocoa Research Center, we think and breed cocoa. Thanks again.